It's really quite interesting, the uh, group that we've got here. It's a, it's a really good mix of people from around the university, so hopefully this will be helpful. <laughs> okay, well, that's fantastic. We've got a room full of innovators. That's, that's really good. That's an excellent starting point. Now, um, let's spruik the university for a minute. At the moment, we are by far the fastest growing university in Queensland. Our applications are up around about 26% on where they were last year. And on the previous year, we were up, uh, I think we were up about 15% uh, last year, and now we beat that again by 26%. The number of uh, our research outputs are going up, the number of research students we're, we're getting is, is looking really good. So if you just use those, and I could bring out others as pointers of success, the university is on a bit of a roll. There's no two ways about it. I think our reputation's improved, and we're getting a lot of positive stories. And I'd say that that is really because we have managed to unleash a lot of innovation potential in people. And I think that's something that we might come back to um, as we go through this. And as I said, this isn't going to be a, a straight lecture. It's going to be a lot of interaction. But I used a word there, unleash, unleash, because I think often in big organisations like universities, we actually really confine people down and we don't let them innovate. And I think that's where we've got to go as a university. I think we've started to do that, to allow people to innovate, but we need to let people innovate uh, right through the organisation. Um, and it's amazing the results you get when you just let people at all levels innovate. Now, were any of you, I don't think any of you would have been on the, uh, um, the conf, came to the conference that we ran for people that were at level, I think it was level six and below. None of that, you did that last year? Oh, Jan was there. Are you, are you level six or below? No, I was actually one of the other Yeah, yeah, okay. That was an incredible conference because it brought together people from all over the university, all the campuses, at those kind of levels. Was it six and below or? Three to six. Three to six. People that we don't normally put a lot of staff development into. Uh, uh, most of us get off to, you know, retreats and planning days and we have lots of staff development. This is a group that really uh, is ignored in most universities and we put something together. And as part of that day, we, we said, come up with some ideas, and if you come up with a good idea, we'll fund it. And I think we gave up to $2,000 for good ideas. It was just amazing, the ideas that came in. And you've probably seen some results of that as you go around the university. Reception areas that now have plants in them and nice furniture, coffee machines all sorts of things around the university because we just unleash that group to be innovative. And in fact, you know, you can find a lot of the innovation in an organisation, not at the centre, because, you know, most of the people sitting in chancery, you know, they've been conditioned to universities. A lot of the really good innovation actually can come from the periphery, but we do a, a really good job at actually stifling that. So I think, you know, we've got to think about how we get innovation going through the organisation. Now, what I want to cover today is uh, basically give you, what is innovation? I mean, we talk a lot about innovation, but really, have we got a, a real definition for it? I'm sure some of you that have come from the business school will give a much better definition than I can. What are the sources of innovation? Who are the innovators? Well, you lot are innovators. I want to talk about innovation at CQ University and then innovation in your workplace, what's happening in your workplace and how you can get innovation going. I've got some exercises to do as we go through and there's some homework because all good courses have homework. And I'm going to talk a bit about my experiences of innovation. Um, but when we often think about innovation, you know, we often think about developing things like this. But innovation doesn't have to be technology-based. Right. So let's have a look. What is innovation? Uh, and I just thought I'd do some definitions, and you can, you can get these wherever you want. Uh, and there's a few classic papers, which we're not going to go into because it's not a lecture. Uh, but Schumpter, or whatever his name was, defines it as using innovation to, uh, as it's part of entrepreneurship. It's part of entrepreneurship, 
And it's about developing new products, new production methods, new markets, and new forms of organization. That's what uh, he defines as innovation. So he says the purpose of it is really about creating new demand, creating new demand with the hope that the new demand that you, that you produce through that innovation will exceed the cost. So now have a look at that. Uh, sorry, I'll go back one. If we go back one, no, we won't. We use this one. It doesn't really matter. Anyone know what that's a picture of? Sorry? CT scanner? See, it's a, yeah, it's a multi-plane CT scanner. Anyone know where it is? Mackay. It's in our Mackay campus. We put it in. No other university has got a CT scanner like that. There's an old, crappy old one from the 1980s down at Monash University. Uh, but we're the only one with a state-of-the-art clinical CT scanner. And we've done with the same with the ultrasound rooms and things. Now, we've put that in. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about the CT scanner being an innovation. But is it an innovation for a university to, to put that kind of equipment in? Why? A new market. Suddenly we've got, you know, our big problem in Mackay at the moment is our accommodation is full up to the brim. We built uh, 72 beds, so we've got about 100 beds there, absolutely full of waiting this room, so we've got to build more accommodation this year. You're right, it's bringing in new markets. People weren't coming to Mackay to study at CQ University. Now we've got people from Brisbane, New South Wales, Victoria coming to study, so it's new markets. New production methods? Maybe a new way of teaching rather than, you know, most schools of radiography, here's a picture of a CT scanner, or you find, but we've put it in. Now, is it, does it create new demand? Does it create new demand? Yeah, yeah. yeah we've said that. Will the cost of uh, that equipment be exceeded by the benefit? But, you know, the only thing that you can really measure an organisation, even a, a public university like CQU, at the... the at the end of the day, it is about finances, isn't it? Now we are, you know, we do things around reputation and we give a lot away and we sponsor things and we give money out. But at the end of the day, that's got to come back to an increase in demand and an increase of uh, resources flowing into the university. So even when we give uh, you know, a piece of land on this campus to the uh, Central Queensland Ind Indigenous Development Corporation, an Aboriginal organisation. You know, we can say we're doing that out of the goodness of our heart and that's wonderful, but really that's an innovation, giving land to an Aboriginal corporation. But is it an innovation in that it, will we reap more from that than it cost us? Well, I would say yes, that is an innovation and you can measure it because our reputation goes up. We're seen as a very indigenous friendly organisation. We have a lot more Aboriginal people milling around the campus. They see that this is a good place to come, a welcoming place, and maybe come here for their education. Maybe we attract more indigenous researchers. All of that adds to that bottom line of increase in value. Because if we're going to take this university forward, we've got to attract and keep the very best people. We've got to attract the very best and then keep them here. And so we've got to make it a good place to work. And I think Christmas parties and things like that, having a bit of fun, showing that we're putting something back for the children of the people that work here is really important. You can see there, uh, have I done sort of a bit of a slide of hand there, you know, what is innovation? And then I've just said, well, it's part of entrepreneurship. Not really a very good definition, is it, if you think about it? So, um, look, I, I think really in a creativity is coming up with the new ideas. And I think we sometimes get confused that to be innovative, we've got to be geniuses. We've got to be able to well, to do what some of you guys are doing with your little nanoparticles of blood looking at how they move in Japan. I mean, you know, that's real genius stuff. But to be innovative, you, you really haven't got to be 
sort of working up there, developing technology and doing that. Innovation really can be at all levels. And I think, you know, creativity is coming up with a new idea, but innovation is bringing it to life. You know, we, how many of us have ideas all the time? I mean, I do. I come, you know, thousands of ideas that I want to do for the university. But how many of them do I actually put into action and do something about? And I bet you're all the same. Everyone in this room has lots of ideas. Everyone is innately creative, creative, I think. But how often do we actually bring them to life? So I think being innovative isn't just about um, you know, coming up with good ideas. It's actually being practical and putting them into place as well. Anyone know who that is? Drew, Drew Dawson, sleep researcher. Adelaide, okay. Anything innovative about his appointment? Board a team. He's one of our two engaged chairs. We, so the idea there where I think we were being innovative, we wanted to lift the university, a step change in research. And like many universities, I think a lot of our uh, strategy in the past was about growing our own researchers, developing people, bringing them on, and then getting them to a place where they're productive researchers. Now that's a good strategy and it's one that we won't reject. We will continue to do that. But I tell you, to get to where we want to be in research, we would never get there. Because one of the problems with growing your own, as soon as you've actually grown them, someone comes and steals them. So that gave us a clue that maybe part of the strategy if we go out and steal some others. <laughs> We want to be, within 10 years, we want to be in the Shanghai Xiaotong ranking of the top 500 research universities. I want us to be ranked in Australia around about 17 or 18 of all the universities for research output. And we decided that we were going to put some cash into that. We were going to go out and we're going to buy some researchers. And this was basically the first cab off the rank, Drew Dawson, who we approached. He does much of his work up here, based in Adelaide, made, but he's up here all the time working in the Galilee Basin and the Bowen Basin and Gladstone. We approached him and he said, yes, he wanted to come on board. And he said, and do you mind if I bring a research team with me? Oh, I don't know, that's okay. We, yeah, three or four people, I guess we can find room for them. No, well, between 35 and 40. And that's what we did. We brought the whole 35 on. But I think what was quite innovative about that, we also bought a campus for them. Innovative? Well, you can wait and see now. Our research is way up. I mean, the number of honours students we've got, PhD students, fantastic. Well, th that's the other interesting things. Often when you go for these innovations, they look very expensive, but they turn out really not to cost you much at all. That group is just about cost neutral, and definitely in a couple of years will be cost neutral, because they're just bringing so much money into the research that they're paying for themselves. And you could argue, I mean, even with that CT scanner, I mean, that, the building up there has been built to take patients, clinical patients. Now, we haven't done that yet, but if we started to put patients through there, the CT scanner would probably pay for itself. I think as a university, and you won't often hear a VC saying this, we get bogged down too much in the cost of things. And I'm quite often saying to my reports, and you probably won't believe this, is it's only money. Stop worrying about the money. Stop worrying about the money. We've got to do it. Because we're at a point now where we've got two years of opportunity. I mean, we've got the caps are off. We can grow as big as we want to do over the next two years. In two, year, in two years' time, one or two things will happen. One is, well, I was going to say Gillard, but is it going to be Gillard, Rudd, or Smith, or whatever? But the Labour Party is going to wake up at what they're doing in higher education is very expensive, they can't afford it, and they will put the caps back on. Or we'll have a Liberal government who will also put the caps back on. But at the moment, we've got a once-in-the-lifetime opportunity uh, we're now two months into it because it started in January, but I think we've got another two years where we can grow as much as we want. Once that stops, the caps will go back on, and wherever we are at that point, we will be at that level, give or take, for the next 20 years. 
So this is our opportunity. So that's what I'm saying to the guys. Let's invest now. Let's invest now because, and get that pipeline growth. I think we can very easily get up to 10,000 students. At the moment, we're about um, 6,800. I think we can get up to 10,000 full-time equivalent domestics very easily in that time frame. And the way some areas are going, like Anthony Weber, we might get 15,000. So this is our time to actually invest. But often, investments actually don't cost you as much as you think they're going to do. So Peter Drucker, if you want to do some reading and some academics can go, this is probably the classic paper uh, on, and from 1985. It was reprinted a few years ago as a classic paper in the Harvard Business Review and it's in the library if you want to read that. Uh, but that's how he defined innovation, the effort to create purposeful focus change in an enterprise's economic or social potential. Uh, so he's winding it out, he's not just looking at economics, he's also looking at social potential. But you'll notice it's purposeful, focus, change. And I think that's what we need really to uh, focus on in the university. Anyone think why that guy on the right and what he's doing is innovative, although I, don't, I didn't realise you were going to be here. <laughs> Well, look, I, I think this is a great form of innovation, and this is looking at, uh, at biodiesel, uh, but not looking from traditional crops. This is a crop, a uh, beauty leaf, that grows here. It's a native plant. It grows in very salty conditions down on the coast. Here's a, a crop that can produce uh, biodiesel, uh, and uh, this is a, a great project, uh, project uh, that we're doing at the university. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a form of innovation. So there's kind of classic innovation research. We've got uh, this project going on in the university. How could you be innovative? How could a university be really innovative around that? Start a biodiesel plan. All of that land that we've got, we've got a lot of land here, but if we grow beauty leaf on it and make biodiesel, what if we say, from now on, all of our vehicles in the university will be diesel vehicles. We're never going to buy a petrol uh, vehicle again. And we're going to uh, uh, use biodiesel that we're going to create here around the campus to fuel those vehicles. What about if, and I've been saying this to Rockhampton City Council, you've got loads of wasteland. You know, you've got plans for it, and maybe in three or four years you're going to build on it. But you've got loads of wasteland. Why don't you plant a crop of this, just grow this stuff everywhere and do the same? Why not run your uh, vehicles on biodiesel that you create here? Why don't we do that? Why don't we do that in the university? So, some people, I mean, and there's lots of innovations going on in the university where people come up the, with an idea and then they uh, get it up and running. So we might want to look a little bit later when we come on to that bit about how some people seem to really run with their innovations and how others have great ideas and they never actually get anywhere, why that happens uh, across the board. I think that's good. It's, it's interesting, there's a, a project uh, being thought about at the moment for over the road in the new laboratories and it's called Innovation Central. Now, whether it'll get up or not, I don't know, but this is uh, um, a community group, and we've got Susan Kinnear from the university very involved. What they want to do is set up this organisation where all of the ideas from the whole of Rockhampton can kind of flow into a sausage machine. Someone comes up with an idea, and then it goes through a process, and it's looked at whether this is a true innovation and it could be put into place. So it could be an example, let's say that a farmer comes along and says, you know, uh, I've got a dam and uh, I've got this really good idea to uh, stop it evaporating and I've tried it. What I do is get bottles, plastic bottles, and I empty them, drink them, screw the top back on, and then I've got thousands of these floating on the dam, thousands of them floating on the dam, and do you know it stops the water evaporating? And the cattle can still come down and drink from the dam because when they stick their nose in, the bottles just move aside. 
And I think I'm the only person doing that. I mean, the problem is that after about six months, the bottles degrade in the sun and they fall apart. But I think that's a really good idea. I mean, if we could come up with some kind of plastic that didn't degrade and we could build that, that would be a good idea. But where does someone take, if that's a farmer, where, where does a farmer take an idea like that? And really, there's not many places to do it. I mean, you might get a company involved, but what we're thinking of, if we have this innovation central, people can come along with ideas like that. They can then be evaluated and then maybe look for funding to develop them as ideas. Now, I think what you're saying is we haven't got anywhere like that in the university. We haven't got a university innovation central where you could take those ideas. Okay, so some ideas of uh, sources of innovation. And again, if you go back to that Drucker paper, basically uh, he says, well, some people are just genius. You know, they aren't really just geniuses. And they come up with innovation. They came up with fantastic ideas, you know, to invent a telephone. And that's just pure genius. And then that leads on to innovation. But Drucker also says in that paper that's really unusual. That's not the most prominent form of innovation in organisation. It's often of a, a purposeful search within the organisation and that's quite often because things like uh, unexpected occurrences. I mean, what anyone think of an unexpected occurrence that's happened to the university over the last three or four years? The big one that we've already talked about. Uncapping. Uncapping. No one saw uncapping coming. Uncapping coming off and then suddenly we can go for it. I mean, all those new programs that we've brought in, if there wasn't any uncapping, it would have been Im almost impossible to do. Or we'd have had to go into existing courses and saying, well, we're going to stop running that course because we want to do this. Much more difficult. So uh, things like that. Uh, but process needs, industry and market changes. Um, what's, what's the big market change in higher education, do you think? Ex yep, exactly. I think if you have a look at distance education and students wanting to go into flexible mode, now it's really interesting if you have a look at our statistics. We've brought on all of these new sexy courses and we've brought you know, sim men in paramedics that, you know, their lips change and they cry and all that and we put CT scanners in and we've built this fantastic new engineering building and, you know, we've got the conservatorium and all of that kind of stuff that's going on. Where's the growth? Distance. If you have a look where that 26% growth is, it's, it's in distance. And I think what we are doing, and we heard it when we went around the room, a lot of our innovation is around that flexible distance area. So but a lot of the reasons why we're getting the growth is because we are starting to see innovation in what we're delivering by distance. So as the first ever paramedic program offered by distance, is it? Yep, yep. We had one of the first uh, engineering distance delivery programs. We've got the only three year online law degree in the country. So we're seeing innovations in that space. I think what the challenge is of us going forward on that is we've got some fantastic innovation in new programs, but we've really got to now look at the, the means of delivering those programs because we are seeing large attrition rates in those programs. So if you take the law program, great. This is an innovative course. It's the first in the country, but it's got very high attrition rates. So we've got to go back and look is why are we getting those high attrition rates? So we've not just got to be innovative in the way that we produce the programs. We've got to be innovative in the way we deliver them as well. And that's not just uh, about the academics in the universe. That's about the professional staff as well. How do we keep people on board? For those of you that went to university or college or whatever, if you actually think about those days, why did you stay on the programme? Because there were days when things got pretty grim and you felt like leaving. Why did you stay at university or college or whatever? Well, relation, I think that's the top of the list. I mean, yes, you wanted to be get your degree and you wanted a job, so there was a vocational hold on you. Um, that was one, definitely. But I think most people probably 
in this room would have gone to a face-to-face. -face. You were there for two or three years. You had a group of friends. And if you left the program, you actually lost those friends. I think with our, the experience of doing distance learning is very different to that. You've got the pull, perhaps the vocational pull, that you want to be a lawyer, but you've got no relationships in there at all. No relationships. So you haven't got that group of friends. You haven't got that uh, group where you went out on a Friday night and got pissed. You haven't got that group that you met with in the coffee room and, and really moaned and bitched about the lecturer. That isn't there. So I think one of the questions is, is how do we build in that kind of social cohesion into our distance learning? Now, do we do that through res schools? Do we do that through some kind of online community? I mean, I think it is a, a massive challenge. There's a lot of people in the university looking at it and doing something about it, but I think we haven't got it cracked yet. Dare I say, when I go through some of the statistics and see very high attrition rates in some courses and almost zero attrition rates in others, I often look at them and I often think, you know, it's about... I don't think anyone cared about the students in there. No one really cared about the students. Where here we had someone that really cared. When we've just done some survey as students, and again on the law degree, one of the things we said is, what about support, you know, our big innovation, supported distance learning, whatever that means. But we, what we thought it meant was having a group in Melbourne, we'll use the campus, we'll have two nights a week where maybe on a Thursday, a judge comes in and does tutorials. We'll have a tutorial series and on uh, Tuesday you can book a 20 minute meeting with a, a, a tutor just to talk about the assignment. And we, we said, is that what you want? They actually said, nah, not interested because of all the things you said. We're at work, we've got family commitments. But what we would like is you to make that, don't put anyone in the room, but make the room available where we can meet up with other students uh, from time to time. Can we? make our own study group. So you might be right, but I, I, I think there is still that need for you know, some kind of relationship between the students. But you're right, how do we deliver that in online? I mean, really, you know, some people would argue all those new programs we've put on board, I mean, running a law degree or a radiography degree, well, you know, that's not like inventing the telephone, is it? I mean, we have seen what others are doing. And I think there's nothing wrong with actually looking at the innovations of others and learning from the others and then putting those innovations into place. So you could say that really, you, you might argue that you know, that's not creativity, it's, it's pure innovation. You're actually taking someone else's creative ideas and then the innovation is you putting it into your own organisation. Fitting into those niches, bringing programmes, maybe being inspired a great deal by another place even by looking at what their curriculum is. It, it, that's innovation in itself. It's quite interesting, this week, no, sorry, last week, on Friday, we signed off on a deal with the Australian College of Kuwait uh, with the engineering degree, or the engineering technology degree. They, they want to use our curriculum, and they've taken it basically lock, stock and barrel, and they're going to deliver it and give their degree. So that's, I mean, that's taken that to the extreme. They've decided, they want an engineering program. They haven't got the resources to develop it themselves, I don't think, or they don't want to go to the expense of them, so they've actually taken ours. And you, you see that happening. I understand that's happening with Paramed up at JCU. JCU has just bought the QUT. Paramed course, lock, stock and barrel, and they're going to deliver it. And we saw two or three years ago people buying medical courses and just buying medical curriculum. Um, is that innovation? It's an interesting trend, though, in, in education that people are saying, look, when you have a look, if you have a look at, um, uh, well, let's take the oral health program, how much it costs for us to develop that program up, it's incredibly expensive. Why don't we just go and buy one? Uh, I'm not sure, but that seems to be... And then people would say, well, that's innovative because we're running the organisation in a completely different way. We're not developing all these programmes. We're just taking the best from around the world and then delivering it lock, stock and barrel. I, just, I, I was thinking about preparing this and innovation and you know, how innovations work. Um, uh, anyone know what that aeroplane is at the top? Oh. It's, a, it's a comet. Made in Great Britain. 
the country of my origin. Okay, so Britain came up with the first jet airliner. The, the only problem is, I think when they built it, they thought they were building a ship because they put great big windows, square windows in it. And uh, the engineers amongst you would know that it's not a good idea in a pressurized vessel to have square holes. And in fact, within a few flights, they started to get metal fatigue and the things were crashing, falling out the sky. The interesting thing, they set up a test uh, bed in Bedford, I think, to test these things. And the scientists doing it set it all up. And it was pressurizing, unpressurizing, just on and off. And he said, you know, we're probably going to have to wait uh, a month. And that will simulate 10 years of flying. And then we'll have a look for the metal fatigue. He actually went home for his tea and they called him at 7 o'clock and said the thing just blew up. It, by, it, within three hours, the thing was gone. So anyway, but very innovative. They came up with the first jet airliner. Okay, it wasn't a success. But look, the people that learned a hell of a lot from the comment was Boeing. And Boeing came up with that airline in the middle, uh, which had round windows. And... Uh, uh, could outperform the comet, and that was incredibly successful. You know, the leading airline. This was at a time in the uh, kind of 60s when air travel was very elite, only the rich traveled, and this was a perfect airplane. But look what came next. Look at the two things that came next from, uh, from that development. On one side, we have um, from Great Britain again. I think the French had something to do with it, but we don't talk about that. But we have Concorde, most, arguably the most innovative aeroplane, or is it innovative, or is it technically advanced? Most technically advanced aeroplane ever built. It, they, the, at the time, the supersonic fighter aircraft of any country, America, Russia, couldn't keep up with it. It just pushed the boundaries on everything. Incredibly expensive, and they build it. Uh, most technically advanced. Meanwhile, the Americans didn't go down that line. They went for continuing to develop the, the Boeing, and we got the Boeing 747 at about the same time as Concorde. Really not very technically advanced. A lot bigger, but basically just a big 707. Which is the most innovative, Concorde or the 747? Well, if you go back to that, where, you know, how much this cost, how much it cost to buy, and then how much value it put, and did the value exceed the cost of the innovation, you'd have to say the 747. Uh, why did Concorde get it so wrong? And, and I think Boeing read the trends. I mean, the trends was that aircraft, uh, uh, air travel wasn't going to be for the elite few. This wasn't going to be something... Uh, you know, it wasn't for the champagne set going to New York and paying big prices. It was actually the likes of us, the likes of us getting on the plane and going, um, well, you know, uh, Anita and I were in Tokyo, we went skiing. You can get a flight from uh, Cairns to Tokyo, 220 bucks. Boeing got it right. It was about the masses flying. Uh, British aerospace or the British government really got it very wrong and it was still that very elite thing. But what I'm I think one of the point I'm making is don't get subduced by technology. I mean, it can be the most advanced thing. It can be just a beautiful machine like the Concorde. I mean, just an incredible machine. But it wasn't that innovative. The creativity, the creative idea was there, but then the implementation. It'd be a bit like me planting, going out and now uh, this afternoon, buying a plow, plowing up all our land and buying, uh, planting beauty leaf. Uh, we would probably get loads of articles in the Australian and in the, um, the campus review about in how innovative this university is, that it's growing all this biodiesel, isn't this fantastic? And it would look, it, you know, it's very creative, but actually when it gets down to innovation, we might be able to run one of our lawnmowers for a week every year on what we produce. Don't get seduced by the, uh, the technology. And I think there's, you know, quite... And the other thing there is, um, you know, the comet, there's uh, a real innovation. I mean, you know, the first out there and, and it, it lost because it was the first 
into the field. And you sometimes see that actually in education, don't you? You see think people do things. And I often think, well, let them take the flack and we just see how that goes for a year. And then if they get away with it, we get away with it as well. Um, and you wonder if there's, um, it's, it's quite interesting. I worked in another university before I came in here. I'd rather not mention the name, but it was north of here. And I remember we, we sat down uh, one day and we decided what kind of university we, do we want to be? And what we were asking ourselves, should we get into distance education in a big way? And we made a decision, the executive in the university made a decision that it wasn't going to get into distance education in any big way. It was going to be a university of touch. It was going to be a university of touch. And it was going to use the technology, the online stuff, to back up the face-to-face. -face. This university made a decision long before I was here to get into distance education and it would be a flexible provider, still have the face-to-face -face some components but the distance stuff. Now where, you know, where is uh, CQU in, in that if, if we've decided to go that? Have we gone down the line of the 747 and as another university to the north of here gone down the Concord line? I'm not sure, but it's a, an interesting one to think about. Steve Jobs talking about innovation. But he says something really interesting, really, he doesn't really care too much about the technology. That's not where they focus. They just focus on the customer, the customer response, the end user, what does the customer think? So they'd go in and they'd look at the iPad or the iPhone and pick it up and say, oh, what about if we put a curve in there? Would that make it feel nicer? And why, why has it got three buttons on the front? Can't we get down to just one button? And why does it take three clicks? Why don't we have one? And it was all about the end user. And he was more or less saying, you know, the technology wasn't that important. Um, I do sometimes wonder in this university whether we, we make a mistake and we get seduced by the technology and we come up with very sophisticated programs and whatever and we forget about the end user. We forget about the member of staff and we forget about the student but God have we got a fantastic program and you know if you've got the brain this size and you know you know computer programming God it's fantastic but we lose sight of the end user and I think if you can find that on YouTube it's well worth you know probably the most successful entrepreneur you know in recent history just talking about running a tech technological company saying he doesn't really care about technology it's all about adding value for the customer and hence adding value uh, to his uh, thing and I uh, Martin told me his other big innovation was in his factory in China he put an anti-suicide uh, fence around the top of the factory because people got so depressed making iPads they kept throwing themselves off the factory. So, completely innovative guy, really. Ah, <laughs> uh, CQU innovation. Well, now I want to, hopefully we've talked a bit about innovation in general. Now we try and get to what Peter was talking about, stuff around here and how do we get innovations in some places. We have got a great history of innovation. I mean, the 10,000 steps and things like that. I mean, there is a great history, the distance learning stuff of innovation, but how come we don't get more innovation coming through? And, and there's Kerry Reid Sell, who was on our list of top um, innovators with Mask Ed, and now she's doing Puppet Ed as well. You know, where would you rather be working? Would you rather be at, I won't mention their name, but they're to the north of here, uh, and you're in a town called Townsville, and you've got 85% market share in Townsville. So really, you've got that 15% of the ones that go to UQ and down there. Where would you rather be? Be working there and trying to develop a university, that university in Townsville? or to be sitting here in Rockhampton where you've got 45% market share. I know where I want to be. But the, the, all of the potential is at this university. Everywhere you look, there's potential. If we've only got a small market share, that means we can grow a big market share. If I'm sitting in Townsville with an 85% market share, I tell you what, there's only one way for me to go. 
And that's for when CQU sets a campus up right in the middle of bloody Townsville and starts nicking all my uh, students because they can be flexible and offer distance. And I mean, I always thought that about this university. Everywhere you look, there's potential. So getting back to that question about international, yes, there's a lot of potential uh, for international. If you have a look to the north, JCU, about 2,500 international students. Look to the south, Sunshine Coast, uh, probably around about 800 these days, 1,000 international students. Us, 300. So there is potential in the international, but we've got so much potential in the domestic as well. I mean, this university can just, everywhere you look, there's potential. Well, hands, hands up if you think that your part of the university is innovative. Oh, that's pretty good. And not innovative. Uh, looking out where all you work. Okay, good. Oh. Okay, so, well, if yes, the ones that said yes, what are the main innovations? Uh, well, how about for you, do you feel, for those that you said yes, you work in a, a, a really innovative place, do you feel that you've got the freedom to be innovative? Can you get a voice to bring in innovations? Yeah. Yep. And how about those that you said no, uh, what are the impediments? What are the impediments? Yeah, and you see that a lot around the university. So you see the creativity, but not the innovation. People come up with um, ideas. Like there's someone been, I can't remember who he is, he's been going on about uh, a microbrewery for as long as I've been here. And <laughs> I still can't get a decent pint here. But, uh, the, the industries, won't, they want success. So they will link with successful, innovative, parts of the university and it's not a just about there's a wrong attitude if you just they want to link with success not bits that are failing look i was just going to say so this it, you know we've, we've now run out of time and now we get to the most important bit so getting innovation uh, going i mean you don't have to be the manager of an area to get innovation going but you probably need to get management on side and, um, you know, if, if some of the, someone said uh, Kerry Reed Searle, uh, uh, you know, was one of our big innovators with mask ed and all that mask stuff, well, she's just persistent. I mean, and I think that's what you've got to be. For, you've got to get a passion for something and just be dogged with it and push it and push it and push it. I mean, like the Myco Brewery, I mean, if, if that's really what you want to do, push it and push it and push it, and push it in a, a, in a way that, you know, put a business plan together, show what other people are doing. I mean, this means working beyond your scope and doing work in your own time and all of that, but that's, I think, how, if you're going to be a champion of innovation, that's the way to do it. The good news about this is that we're desperate for innovation. We're desperate for people to rise above everyone else and really have these ideas. I think brainstorming, doing this sort of exercise, I think this is really good to get people on side. And then write an innovation plan. I mean, really set up uh, uh, what is this innovation? You know, what is the innovation? How is it going to add value? What are the costs going to be? How could we implement it? Um, and then really get it, sell it to your manager. And if that manager, I mean, I shouldn't say this because this goes against all the rules of the university, but if, that, if you can't sell it to that manager, find another manager that you can sell it to. Uh, so find and, and really be a champion for it. I know this is hard, and you can all tell me a hundred reasons why this wouldn't work, but we've got a few people that have, have made it work, and we are desperate for these things. Uh, so what do I think an innovation plan should look like? Well, what is the innovation? How will it add value to CQU? Uh, what resources, if any, will be needed? So, you know, if it is this disaster centre, what do we actually need for that? Who will be involved? How will success be measured and when? I mean, so how will you know that this thing has been successful? And that's probably got to be linked in with number two as well. Uh, are, are there wider uh, implications? Could it be rolled out to other parts of the university? And I'm going to run a session on change management. And I mean, you, every, I'm, 
be teaching most of you to suck eggs if you bothered to come to that one. You know, make it try, uh, pilot it. Can we run it in this place? I mean, it's no big deal if we run it here in Rockhampton. And if it works in Rocky, then we roll it out to the whole university. So uh, that. And how does it fit in with other plans? I mean, does this fit in with our engagement plan? Does it fit in with our renewal plan? I mean, if you can put a really good idea around innovation that links in with uh, engagement and renewal, uh, with the renewal plans, you, you're almost there, straight off. Be that an academy of sport, a microbrewery, a disaster management centre, um, a biodiesel thing, or something as simple as how do we address students when they phone up? What's the standard when we phone up? Do we introduce ourselves? It can be very small innovation. But if there are ideas, we want ideas, and we want them coming from all over the uni university. I mean, I've heard some really great ideas. I, I've heard some really great ideas. I like the Academy of Sport. I like the microbrewery. I like the biodiesel. I like some of the smaller things that came out on this. But, you know, like most of you, when I get back to the office, there'd be a million other things to do. So. You know, it's, it's down to you as the innovators to push these and make them happen. And I guess if you go back to Kerry Reed's cell, that's what she did. I'm sure there were, a, you know, in that school of nursing, I'm sure there were a million ideas which were just as good as, I know, I'm going to get a rubber mask, stick it over my head and pretend to be a patient. <laughs> I'm sure that over a period of time there's been thousands of ideas there, but you just had a woman that was tenacious decided that she was going to develop that innovation and push and push and find funds where she could, push it with a manager, go and promote it. And, you know, that's why we've got that great innovation. That's why the university is building that tremendous reputation in that area and is really driving simulation because one person t took it from the creativity, which we all do ten times a day, to the innovation. Look, I don't know if, whether anyone found that useful at all, but I enjoyed it. Um, and it was really good meeting up with you guys and just listening to some of your ideas. I'd say have a go at this if you've got something that you really want to bring in and we'll we see whether we can make some of them work. Um, I just uh, wanted to run these sessions because I guess you're a group of people that I don't get a lot of time to spend time with. And as I said, often the innovation comes sort of from all over the organisation, not just those, um, you know, those people in Chancery who just spend most of the time eating and drinking and uh, living off the fat of the schools anyway. Uh, so it, I, it was a good chance to mix. So there are some other ones that are, I'm doing. I think we're doing uh, change management, motivation, presentation skills. After this, you probably won't want to come to that. Huh? Conflict, yeah, we're going to get some mud and a boxing <laughs> ring and get some conflict. Is that it? Yeah. One a month. One a month. So you're very welcome to uh, um, come to those if you want.